Wars occupy a center stage in human history and international affairs. They shape human society further, leaving behind legacies and stories that writers and novelists have always took advantage of when releasing their novels, short stories, and plays. William Shakespeare did it when composing the classic and world-famous play Julius Caesar, where his characters perform in front of the audience to capture the essence of the Roman Civil War, when the great general and once dictator of Rome is finally murdered by the Senate, resulting in an instant repercussion that would shape Rome for centuries to come. Similar to such contests that took place then, and have been taking place in the whole course of human history, one political grindfest that took place after the Second World War ended was the Vietnam War. Nearly the whole world knows it, will never forget it, and has its importance etched on stone and paper. Its importance as the ultimate showdown between two opposite poles, the communism of the East and democracy of the West, places itself as a pillar of human endurance and the legacy it has left in the whole of Southeast Asian bloc, which is still felt today economically and politically. What really started as the end of French colonial rule in Vietnam turned itself into one of the deadliest political showdowns of the 20th century, after the end of the Great War, just a decade ago. Modern-day Vietnam upholds this event as one of its most defining events in an era when several nations tried to compete for the top position in international spheres of influence, as well as economic and socio-political realms. The Vietnam War throughout its progression from a minor insurgency led to conflict to an all-out international war fought between several nations and combatants would take with it millions of casualties and innocent lives and would further question the role of the U.S. as the dominant power after World War II. It would also seal the end of the erstwhile Soviet Union and give communism a lasting impact to the point that it became nearly extinct, except being present in only theory and paper. The Vietnam War, in its ultimate essence, end the long and grinding Cold War that had been existing since the Korean affairs, and would pave way for modern democratic setups in a region that identified itself as ancient and feudalistic. Nearly all of the native participants in this conflict, from Vietnam to Laos and Cambodia, all would experience permanent socio-political transformations, and perhaps their entry into the modern world. The Vietnamese Background Before understanding the full history and the essence of the Vietnam conflict, it's imperative first to understand the background that existed prior to the U.S. involvement in the war. Vietnam is an ancient land, with its culture steeped deep inside history, and its relations with neighboring Buddhist countries and the colonial powers of the 19th century. A very major part of the conflict that arose back then was because of the direct clash between Vietnamese values, the resistance to French rule, and Vietnam's natural association with communism because of China in the north and communist-influenced Indochina region, asserted by the Soviet Union. Since Vietnamese society was such, that communism had become a popular ideology in the nation. Vietnam, during the 1800s, used to remain a French colony. Its annexation to the small colonial empire of France completed in the 1850s with complete pacification by 1893. What followed for the next seven decades were phases of peace and skirmishes between French authorities and Vietnamese people that ultimately escalated to the Great Vietnam War of the 1970s. French rule would remain short-lived, however, because of the Second World War that would witness complete annexation of France by Germany and transforming it into a client state. During this war, this French colony would accept the Vichy of France and continued its affairs at the region with consultation with German authorities, who housed thousands of miles away in Europe. Shortly after the takeover of France, the 1940s would witness Imperial Japan invading Southeast and Pacific Island nations and regions that formed as several colonies of dominant colonial powers that existed here, most notably Great Britain. The invasion of the Japanese would come as a total overwhelming force as they took control over swaths of islands and the Pacific in just a matter of months, resulting in the biggest surrender of British forces in Singapore 
when close to 80,000 British personnel and officials laid down their arms in front of the Japanese. The initial events taking around in the Pacific were proving a major advantage for Imperial Japan, as its march went around unopposed in several of the Pacific regions and native countries. However, the scenario in Vietnam differed from the events that were happening deep inside Pacific. Vietnam could never fully be colonized by the French, and several insurgent groups existed throughout its colonial history that were committed on waging a proxy war on the French. Vietnam during this time was completely surrounded by the French on one side and Imperial Japan on the other, trying to make the whole region its own colony. During the Great War, however, the Vietnamese gained much support from the Japanese as they took control over French Vietnam. This move was never really welcomed in one sense, since the Japanese themselves were seen as outsiders, although they were supportive in decreasing French power in the region. Consequently, the Viet Minh was formed as the legitimate government of Vietnam, asserting its independence from France, but also opposed Japanese occupation in 1945. Viet Minh would continue to assert its influence and legitimacy as the new government of independent Vietnam, at least until the 1960s, when rapid political developments started taking place in the forest nation. During the Great War, Viet Minh contributed a large part towards resistance to both the Japanese and the French, with several political steps consisting of propagandas and intrigues that urged people to boycott French authorities and the government. In one instance, the Viet Minh urged the Vietnamese people to ransack rice warehouses and refused to pay taxes to French authorities in light of a great famine in 1945 that took with it a reported two million people. The Viet Minh continued to remain till the Japanese surrender in 1945 and the end of the Great War. Since Germany had been routed back from France at the end of the war, France was free in dealing with Vietnamese affairs. However, till this time, the French resources had been depleted and it was impossible for them to retake Vietnam as their rightful colony. The Viet Minh had grown immensely in power till this time, and the Japanese had been reportedly supplying arms and weaponry secretly to the Viet Minh after the end of the war to continue on the resistance against the French. France was also powerless during this time to deal with the nation's internal affairs since the Imperial Japanese Army was the only force that could maintain law and order in the region. Even after the end of the war, the Japanese continued to maintain such affairs, thus keeping French intervention at a distance, even detaining French officials like Jean Santenay. In the meantime, Ho Chi Minh officially declared the independent Republic of Vietnam and won elections in Central and North Vietnam to form the first ever independent Vietnamese government. However, as an unfortunate event, it so happened that the Allied powers in the end agreed that the region belonged to the French and that French authorities would soon start beginning to gain power again in the region. This was seen as a very unwelcome step, and several Vietnamese officials condemned this declaration. Ho Chi Minh thus started putting forward steps to neutralize any attempt for a French retake of the region. Soon after the end of the war, and when Allied powers started recognizing France as the original holder of the region, it was agreed upon that the British would start occupying southern Vietnam, while Chinese troops would move in from the north as the French had no armies in the region. Several rearmaments for the French took place, and Ho Chi Minh acted swiftly in consultation with the Soviet Union. The agreement was reached with the French that Vietnam would remain as a declared independent state recognized by France in lieu of Chinese forces in North Vietnam. The agreement was never fully recognized, and upon the British leave, the Viet Minh would soon start a large-scale guerrilla war against the French, since the latter entered the city of Hanoi and ousted the Viet Minh in 1946. This would initiate the start of the First Indochina War. Divided We Stand Soon after the Viet Minh declared a guerrilla war on the French, a complex political intrigue had developed in the international sphere. 1950 saw the start of the Korean War, which was yet another case of the communism clashing with Western powers. Korean War would have long-term repercussion in Indochina 
As well, during this time, the Soviet Union asserted its support for a unified and independent Vietnam against the French-backed efforts by the U.S. and U.K. Since by this time China was the new communist ally of Soviet Union, the march toward a more conventional, large-scale war had now started, with little promise for holding peace talks, and the future was becoming inevitable. The insurgency against the French had started on a massive scale as Viet Minh continued to supply its supporters and loyalists with Chinese-supported weapons and ammunition. While the U.S. and other Western powers backed France and recognized the government of Vietnam under Bao Dai, based in Saigon, the Viet Minh put their headquarters at Hanoi in the north. American aid to South Vietnam was immense, with some $300 billion being provided. The scenario in Vietnam was now becoming increasingly tense as a situation of a large-scale military conflict seemed clear on the horizon, as the Western powers were clear and prepared themselves on thwarting the spread of communism in the whole region, while the Viet Minh, backed with China and Soviet Union, were determined to oust the French and its allies and to establish a communist-led state of independent Vietnam. The battle lines started getting clearer each day, as none of the talks and dialogues were leading to fruitful results. Of course, as is the case with political progress, both sides started issuing propagandas and agendas with the North stressing on freedom Vietnam from colonial rule, and that South Vietnam was allying and compromising with colonial powers in a bid to align itself with the Western bloc. South Vietnam, on the contrary, thought it right to oust communist forces in the country issuing its own version of political thought that communism was antisocial and that several communist countries had been directly or indirectly involved in proxy dictatorships, resulting in an aggressive tactic to influence neutral nations, even using the hand of force to establish their influence. So the reasons behind this conflict of ideologies were purely socio-political. On the other hand, Vietnamese society and electorate in general aligned themselves in these two ideologies of thought. One group believed that the situation of the country was such that only communism was fit right to make the country progress further on economic lines while remaining aligned to neighboring communist nations, while the other group was inclined more toward Western thought of economic development on the basis of capitalism and free ownership of capital and new resources. It was this division in societal opinions that further escalated the conflict into more like a civil war that had several overseas nations participating on its course. By the 1960s, the Viet Minh had been successful in waging a proxy war on the French and the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, carried out by General Vo Nien Giap, gave a stunning defeat to French occupation in North Vietnam. In just a single event, almost all of French garrison over the region surrendered and the French president decided on the immediate withdrawal of French troops. At the Geneva Convention, a ceasefire was signed between the Vietnamese and the French, and independence was officially given to Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. This marked the official exit of the French with the North Vietnamese finally overseeing an even more prophesied future, that of reuniting the rest of the region under the communist flag. However, the conflict had just started and there were enough vultures flying on the horizon that most probably got ignored by Vietnamese authorities. With France officially and fully departing from the region, even bigger powers were monitoring the situation. Washington did not appreciate the happenings at Dien Bien Phu, with several of its key advisors recommending a neutral attitude to be kept at best. General Eisenhower, the five-star general who led the Allies to complete victory during World War II, remained apprehensive of the situation, even urging the president to maintain neutrality in this affair, as there were rumors of Vietnam developing nuclear weapons. However, such things have not been proved yet, and there are missing records till date that challenge this claim. The situation in Vietnam was now becoming very reminiscent of the Korean War. The country was divided on political and social lines, and none of the steps taken by Eisenhower and his allies to prevent a possible strife between political forces was heeding in any results. Eisenhower as president effectively prevented U.S. involvement in the initial stages of the conflict, 
even urging the people of Vietnam to go for free and unbiased elections to decide on whether the nation wanted to adopt communism or become aligned toward the Western Bloc. His move was made clear that the U.S. would aid South Vietnam if at all a strife took place, although direct involvement in the war was out of the question, at least for him. Successive presidents after Eisenhower, too, took the same wise path of keeping the U.S. out of the increasing Vietnamese conflict. However, these events would take a U-turn starting from the 1970s when the war became increasingly tense, inflicting considerable damage to the civilian population. In 1954, upon urging by the Eisenhower administration to carry out free and fair elections in South and North Vietnam, the results received were mixed, and there was a political deadlock. North Vietnam reportedly voted for the communist leader Ho Chi Minh, with several of the surviving records statistically reporting the results standing at 88%, while South Vietnam decisively voted for Ngo Den Dim, with 99% votes. Although the latter were considerably rigged by the presidential leader in the South, several American and Western Bloc authorities reported a more modest 70 to 80% of the votes. This created a severe political deadlock, and the division was more than just clear. Eisenhower and his allies had absolutely no choice now but to watch as further events unfolded. Escalations of War During the time when Kennedy won the 1960 U.S. presidential election, the situation in Vietnam and its adjoining areas had already become very grim. John Kennedy sought to throw ash on fire that could cool down for a longer time, but his assassination during a rally gave to his insight and vision to prevent a large scale in Indochina a massive blow. President Kennedy had come up with one of the most brilliant plans to prevent a massive strife in the region, sometimes called as the American Plan, that was basically an extension to the policy that was provided by President Eisenhower. American aid to the South did not stop there, and Washington insisted on providing financial and political aid to keep Ngo Den Dinh's regime to the strongest level as was possible. However, South Vietnamese government was being proven extremely inept at keeping even its domestic issues at check, as several military coup attempts were carried out on Ngo Den Dinh. The southern government's inability to deal with the tense situation in the region further amplified, as several of the key leaders of the South were accused of becoming involved with the North Vietnamese whose government at the time was proving itself much more efficient and effective at dealing with the southern political machine. The North Vietnamese government, with its support from the People's Republic of China and several communist allies, was hell-bent upon uprooting the southern regime, and for quite some time it was extremely efficient at that. One of the reasons behind the failure experienced by the South Vietnamese government, in spite of receiving millions of dollars as financial aid, and possessing a better equipped military, was its association with extreme corruption and nepotism. Promotions and political affairs were carried out in an overly biased manner, and several groups had formed that would monopolize policy making and implementation. The South Vietnamese army, in spite of being better equipped, was more poorly led than its northern counterpart, with generals like Nguyen Giap of the North, who ended French occupation in one blow being its core members. In the South, however, the army was poorly led, and several of its generals lacked the drive and initiative to carry out efficient anti-insurgency operations. Several of its leaders had even shown reluctance in going into combat, with Ngo Den Dinh himself vomiting in one event that required his attention during an attack from communist guerrillas. In addition, the southern government because of its inclination toward corruption and monopolization of policy affairs, got involved in even more vicious cycles. Public opinion was being greatly ignored, as the capitalist policymakers and officials possessed a life that was markedly different from the peasant population that formed nearly 80% of the Vietnamese population. Public regulations was getting ignored that resulted in mass protests and attempts to oust the Dien government were carried out. Dien by the mid-1960s, had become so paranoid that U.S. advisors described him as concerned with only preventing further military coups and not looking into what was happening at the ground level. 
several Kennedy advisors had even sought to increase military intervention and supply U.S. troops to the region, a suggestion that got rejected by him, stressing on the fact that even if Americans were to gain a considerable strategic advantage in the region, this would prove very retrogressive and have grave adverse effects in the long term, considering the international sphere. Several key advisors also sought to increase military presence in the region, in one form or another. Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow advised Kennedy to send U.S. troops disguised as flood relief workers. Another suggestion rejected by Kennedy insisted instead to increase military aid to South Vietnam. By the mid-1960s, American soldiers numbered around 16,000, up from only 900 advisors during Eisenhower's time. This force would continue to swell in the coming decades, in spite of several advises by the Kennedy administration of the danger of replacing the French as a perceived colonial force and bleed like the French did, as was said by John Kenneth Galbraith. In spite of the grave situation, Kennedy increased military aid to Vietnam rather than increasing direct military intervention. In the South, however, events were becoming more and more unfortunate for the Southern government and the U.S. allies. Ngo Dinh Diem was shot down and killed during a coup as public discontent increased to alarming levels. Ngo Dinh Diem was a fervent Catholic and supported the minority Christians in the region, and this caused some grave consequences in the bordering areas. It was in fact becoming a popular perception that the southern government itself was transforming into a despotic dictatorship, since several events were plunging the government into chaos and rhetoric. Discontent on the Diem government exploded during 1961, when the Buddhist flag was banned on Visak, the Buddha's birthday resulting in shootings that killed nine people, mostly Buddhists. As a retaliatory move toward the North's commitment to carry out insurgency operations in the bordering areas, several of the key historical sites and Buddhist pagodas were raided by the police and law enforcement, further sprinkling salt to the issue. The Northern government, meanwhile, took full advantage of these events, as they issued propaganda after propaganda, accusing the southern government of being anti-national and allying with colonial powers, as they further increased military presence in the region and possibly an invasion of the south. During this meantime, Ngo Dinh Diem was assassinated in the 1963 coup that gave way to chaos and confusion in Saigon. The U.S. sought to fix the problem by deciding on the next regime in South Vietnam with little success on establishing a stable one. A series of unstable governments came and exited as South Vietnam plunged into a further political chaos, while the North simply looked on and increased their intensity and effort to further destabilize South Vietnamese authorities. By 1969, and upon appointment of the new American president, Lyndon Johnson, the situation in Indochina was increasingly becoming tense and the region seemed like a time bomb that could explode any moment. North Vietnamese influence on the bordering areas had become sealed, and the NBA was now increasingly infiltrating southern territories. By the time Johnson won the elections after Kennedy's death, several Congress spokespersons asserted that unlike the situation during Kennedy's time, when he focused on Europe and Latin America, the focus now was completely on Vietnam, as this was the apex of the spread of communism. South Vietnam's inability to deal with the crisis and make its territories secure finally prompted U.S. to officially intervene and in some time even declare war on North Vietnam. Escalation During Johnson's Tenure The next incoming president after Kennedy's death was Lyndon B. Johnson, and he spent almost all of his tenure during the Vietnam conflict. He was fervently opposed to communism, and as the Cold War continued on, his administration made itself clear on the shifting the focus from Latin America and Europe during Kennedy's time to Indochina, owing to the region's increasingly volatile environment. This challenge was now clear and inevitable on the jungle-covered hills and marshlands of Indochina. Several adjoining areas of Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Laos were under direct threat from North Vietnam and its communist-supported allies from the North. During the time when South Vietnam plunged itself into complete political chaos, North Vietnam strengthened its position 
and recruited as many members as was possible through its population. Ho Chi Minh was one of the first charismatic and independently elected leaders for the North in several decades, and people rallied behind his message, perceiving his vision as revolutionary and for the common good of Vietnamese people. The North also bolstered as possessing some of the finest generals like Nguyen Giap, who had shown their ability on the most stressing situations. Being an insurgent group of around 16,000 in 1959, the Viet Cong had by 1964 become 100,000 strong army, able enough to conduct long-term guerrilla warfare in the South. These numbers are exclusive to the NVA, which numbered from 800,000 to nearly a million men, more than enough to overrun the South in just a matter of weeks or months. The latter was a conventional army, carrying out military operations supported by the Chinese and other communist allies, while the Viet Cong was more of a loosely formed, semi-autonomous group, consisting of militias that mostly carried out guerrilla operations. Each organization depended on the other to carry out large-scale military operations, while conducting skirmishes and raids on important posts and infiltrating bordering areas as well. During Johnson's time, the Vietnam conflict rose to its ultimate peak after the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident, where several U.S. naval vessels patrolling the seas were either attacked or stalked by, in some instances, unknown boats. A more detailed investigation into these incidences never really reproduced meaningful results, since not much evidence was being found to prove the notion that it was the Viet Cong trying to ambush American vessels like the USS Turner Joy and USS Maddox. Maddox had even fired torpedoes upon several boats that were doubted to be Viet Cong, although this remained pretty unclear and murky. When asked by the media on this specific incident, Johnson replied to the Under Secretary of State George Ball that this was like shooting at flying fish. That the U.S. had pledged allegiance with South was more than clear during Kennedy's time itself. The North knew this, and Ho Chi Minh had even told the media that the North was open to making peace with the Americans if they are willing, and that he will invite the Americans for afternoon tea if a peace treaty is actually signed. In one sense, this was a purely Vietnamese civil war, where the North perceived U.S. allies as being interfering in the affairs of Vietnam. The Tonkin incident was enough for the U.S. to pitch up its military intervention. The attacks at American vessels and naval bases in Indochina, and several attempts at raiding and capturing certain American ground bases at the bordering areas, had made it clear that the North was on the offensive, and with an army of almost a million strong, they would most certainly start their offensive at any point they perceive as the best. Not just that, but in addition to bolstering everything that suggested that the North was eager and preparing itself for the next big offensive, several events, like the Battle of Dong Shai and the Battle of Binh Gia, were testaments to the inept and inefficient leadership of the Southern government, as the North decisively defeated the Southern army in both these engagements, even instilling conventional offensive in one of them communicating to the world that the Northern Army was not a mere militia organization, but a full-scale conventional one, capable of defeating fully equipped enemy armies. The South was till now being perceived as better equipped, but the year 1965 was now telling otherwise. This was also very alarming for the U.S. administration. In 1965, the Southern government finally established itself as a stable one under Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Ki, and Chief of State Nguyen Bien Thu through a military coup. Sadly, the results at Dong Shai and similar other battlefields nullified the existence of a stable government at Saigon, since the South was now depleting its men and resources. The Americans finally cleared the decision to intervene. By 1965, U.S. forces too had swelled up to around 200,000 men and this led to the administration giving way to several operations that were carried exclusively by American forces. Washington relied on exceptional firepower and air power, realizing the strategic aspect that the North lacked an equally strong air force. So it was deemed fit and necessary to engage their ground forces from the air, resulting in a conflict that would earn tags and names as one of the most bombed conflicts 
thousand million tons of missiles and napalm were used by American airplanes to destroy strategic hideouts and bases of the NVA, planned at clearing out the path first for American ground forces to launch their offensive plans, like the Tet Offensive that followed in the 1970s. During this time, the Vietnamese conflict had turned itself in. The events at Dong She and similar battlefields injured severely the ranks of the South Vietnamese army and reduced their morale to an all-time that resulted in massive desertion rates and plummeting motivation. The North Vietnamese were clear on their cause as they deployed thousands of troops into southern territory, destroying several important RVNA bases and airfields. As a retaliatory step, Washington decided on finally deploying American forces and stopping any communist advance from the North. In the beginning, U.S. forces were instructed to be defensive as the North sent men in thousands to evade the South, with several operations becoming successful in achieving the objective. Approaching the End However, this was merely enough to damage the ranks of the NVA that continued to recruit people from the northern countryside and making sure American forces were outnumbered three to one on all accounts. In one media response, Ho Chi Minh even told press persons of a warning to Americans that if they want to wage war for 20 years, then we'll give war for 20 years. The morale and motivation in the ranks of NVA was multiple times higher than its southern counterpart. However, in several instances, U.S. forces were able to effectively contain Vietnamese offense. In 1967, the NVA launched the Tet Offensive, with 85,000 NVA troops accompanied by their Viet Cong allies into southern Vietnam. The NVA bombed several areas and urban centers, and ferocious fighting, urban fighting, raged for several months. This was perhaps the most violent period of the Vietnam conflict, as thousands of American casualties filled up coffins, and even more of the RVNA soldiers died of fighting, disease, and lack of supplies. Civilian populations suffered equally, if not less, and millions died during this time. The Vietnam conflict, however, was not resulting in a permanent resolve. American troops could never number enough to rival NVA troops and there was lack of support on the Allied side to launch a full-scale anti-NVA offensive. American administration had also ignored or overlooked the capability of the NVA that was proving a very challenging adversary. Added to its leadership, formed up by generals that were incomparable to the leadership shared by the South Vietnamese, the situation in Vietnam was now turning against Washington as years went by and coffins continued to fill in. Despite the Allied forces possessing superior firepower and technology, no considerable gain was made, at least during the last years of the war. Several operations, like Operation Commando Hunt, Operation Roland Thunder, among others, were successful in reaching preliminary objectives, but failed to inflict considerable damage to the NVA. The Tet Offensive was seen both as a failure and a success on the hands of the Americans, in the sense that Allied forces were able to hold off the crux of the NVA offensive for several months, but could never withstand the massive wave. From the NVA's point of view, the Tet Offensive was a major success in terms of political gains. So, although the Allied forces repulsed several NVA offenses, they had failed to take control of several ground bases and territories in the north, and amounted to a sound defeat when measured from a strategic point of view. On the other hand, while the Tet Offensive saw some of the worst military disasters for the NVA, it proved to be a major political victory for them as Allied forces diminished in the region, while the NVA retained much of their original stance. By 1969, more than 50,000 U.S. troops lost their lives, and the coming President Richard Nixon called for immediate withdrawal of American forces. The movement against the Vietnam War had been gaining much momentum that prompted all officials and the administration to give way to American withdrawal, what Nixon called as the Nixon Doctrine. Richard Nixon also called for Vietnamization, which catered to providing just a sufficient enough defense force to South Vietnam to withstand, if at all, the remaining NVA offensive in the area. <laughs>
Since the Tet Offensive marked the turning point of American involvement in the war, an official decree was thus given to start evacuating American officials and troops housed in every corner of southern Vietnam. By 1973, everybody of American birth had been evacuated as the NVA continued its total offensive, capturing key towns and strategic points without considerable resistance. And this was also the year when Richard Nixon put an official end to the American involvement in the Vietnam conflict by declaring peace with North Vietnam and ending American aid to the South. In the final years, the North Vietnamese launched their final offensive against Saigon and captured the city in 1975 almost instantly. On 30 April 1975, victorious NVA troops finally waved the NVA flag on the Independence Palace and installed on it. This marked the official end of the Vietnam War. In the coming months and decades after the huge conflict ended, Vietnam still continued to haunt those dark days of death when millions of Vietnamese lost their lives, just like it keeps haunting now. The Vietnam conflict was, after World War II, the only modern conflict that would take such a huge toll on human life, the third perhaps being none other than the Bosnian War of the 1990s. Its repercussions were massive, but sadly short-lived as the Soviet Union would extinguish in 1991, taking with it the ideology of communism that so many Vietnamese had laid down their lives for. After the end of the war, there was a very unfamiliar lull in the whole region. Within five years of the end of the war, Vietnam became its former self, a Southeast Asian backwater that had withstood one of the most violent conflicts of the 20th century. Even in today's world, Vietnam still continues to remember those years that lasted for almost two decades. Nostalgically, Vietnamese landscape is still filled with so many landmines and bombed craters that in spite of identifying itself as a neutral, laid-back forest nation of the Southeast, its identification with the turbulent era of the Cold War and the determination by which communism won here will remain as a testament and a milestone in human history.